Growth failure is an important condition which is encountered by a pediatrician and one which really requires a significant amount of clinical decision making before proceeding with investigations because uh, of the plethora of causes of growth failure, the list of investigations is numerous and uh, therefore unless we have a strategic planning as far as investigations are concerned, we might be overdoing growth failure assessment. While on the other hand, a certain subset of individuals, one in three children with growth failure will have a significant pathology, which if missed at a time could result in drastic consequences. So assessment of a short child is really balancing between not doing unnecessary workup in children who have physiological growth failure, while doing reasonable workup and not missing children who have a pathological cause. So if you look in short stature, it can broadly be classified into either a physiological form, which is the most common form of growth failure, which will represent around 6 to 70 percent children presenting to the pediatric endocrinologist. And from a pediatrician perspective, it would be around 80 percent of children, namely constitutional delay of puberty and growth and familial short stature. While pathological causes will be one uh, which will account to around 20 to 40 percent of all cases. Within pathological problems, the problem could actually lie within the growth plate in the setting of a child who has dysplasia, who has small for gestational age, genetic causes of Turner syndrome, while there could be secondary causes in which the growth plate is normal but the environment is, is causing the problem. And in the environmental problem, it can broadly be either a nutritional cause in which either there is not enough nutrition like malnutrition, absorption, increased requirements, infection which can cause or we can have an endocrine cause like hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency or Turner syndrome. So the key questions which needs to be answered in a child who comes to us with growth failure is first of all whether this child actually has short stature, if it is short stature whether it is a normal variation or a disease and finally whether it is nutritional or endocrine. So the key issue that we have to answer is what is this child really having short stature? Is workup required? Why is it child short? Is it physiological or pathological? And finally, how do we proceed? So to answer the first question, we need to really measure the child and plot on the chart. So I just put forward a few cases to see how we can go forward in terms of assessment. This is the first child whose height is much below the third centile. So this child definitely requires evaluation. So if somebody is really short, by that we mean height standard deviations go less than minus 3 or less than first centile requires evaluation. What about this child who is just below the third centile? Uh, in this situation, we have option of doing workup now or we can wait and watch. And on follow-up, what we see is that this child is actually drifting away. So somebody who is short and not growing, that is height standard deviation score is minus 2 to minus 3 and growth velocity is less than minus 1 or somewhere around uh, 4 centimeters per year, we need to be confined. But do you think this child requires evaluation? The height is actually between 3rd to 10th centile. The parents are really, really concerned in this setting. Ideally, if you look at the chart and assume that this child actually has a normal uh, mid-parental height, we don't need much evaluation. But when we backtrack, we find that this child was quite tall to begin with and the last two years has not grown anything and this would indicate that this is a situation of a, a pathological acquired cause of growth retardation which is very important. So not growing at all that is crossing of two or more percentile lines is a significant cause. So somebody who is very short, short and not growing or not growing at all requires evaluation. The next issue is, is it physiological or pathological? And to answer that question, we have to look at three basic things. One is the growth chart and we have looked into the growth chart assessment uh, presentation that how looking at the pubertal status, the bone age, the height age and weight age and mid-parental expectation, we can broadly classify children into familial, constitutional delay, pathological and within pathological, nutritional or endocrine causes. Pubertal status and bone age assessment are absolutely vital and have been covered in different presentations to look for whether it's physiological or pathological. Once we have identified pathology, the next question is how do we proceed in terms of further workup? And in that, 
Once we have identified a pathology, the next issue is to look for what is the real cause of that pathology and in that regards have to look at any identifiable genetic syndrome, whether it is a nutritional cause or an endocrine cause and finally if and how to work up for IGF-1 deficiency like growth hormone deficiency or resistance. In many situations, the diagnosis is pretty obvious. If you look like a child like this who is clearly having a, a situation wherein the upper segment is normal and lower segment is very low, the diagnosis of chondroplasia is pretty evident. What about this girl? And we can see this is classical webbing of neck and this is the uh, classic presentation of Turner syndrome. And this in fact is the initial report of Turner syndrome where we see that there is short stature, webbing of neck, shield chest, wide carrying angle which can be present. One of the most important pointers which we should look at at any girl who presents to us with growth failure is to ask her to make a fist and not to really punch at you but at to look at the short fourth metacarpal. So if there is a depression at the fourth metacarpal area that will indicate that this is brachymetacarpia most likely Turner syndrome in the setting of short stature or the possibility of pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Turner syndrome is a very important diagnostic consideration in any girl because it accounts for around 1 in 1000 girls and is a, around 10% of all children with growth failure would have Turner syndrome. Importantly, now we are identifying more girls with Mozak Turner syndrome who can actually have some pubertal development. 5% can have Minaki and some of them can actually have normal pregnancy outcome as well. So Turner syndrome should be suspected in any girl who has growth failure irrespective of pubertal development. And what's very important to understand is that in many situations we think that if we do a FSH level and if the FSH is high, we diagnose it as Turner syndrome. The approach is entirely wrong because in that case you will be missing the Y cell line as far as the uh, chromosomal abnormality is concerned and therefore karyotype is essential in all short girls in that perspective. What about this child who presented with rickets in short stature? So the important causes and considerations in a child with short stature and rickets include uh, renal failure, malnutrition, celiac disease and renal tubular acidosis. So in this case the child actually had hypokalemia an ultrasound showed a uh, nephrocalcinosis indicating a diagnosis of distal renal tubular acidosis. What about 7 year old boy? Height is uh, 101 and weight is 15 kgs. Had uh, clubbing on examination and growth uh, failure which fitted more into a uh, nutritional pattern with the weight being more affected. This most of our situations would be celiac disease and was found to be positive as far as TTG was concerned. If you have a child like this walking to your clinic, it will be very unfortunately delayed diagnosis of hypothyroidism. But remember that hypothyroidism may present without any clinical features. So thyroid functions should be done in all short children and they should include both free T4 and TSH levels because we might be missing central hypothyroidism in that perspective. What about this child? Short and plump child. Classical presentation, cherubic facies, micropenis, undescended testis. This is a classical situation of what is known as growth hormone deficiency or growth hormone excess. Often people will ask us why do we need to really assess growth hormone access in such situation and the answer to that is the child on the right hand side who has severe growth failure, micropenis, undescended testis, pot belly. Growth failure however is even more remarkable and the growth hormone levels were very high. So this is a case of growth hormone insensitivity syndrome and unless we diagnose it, it will be a waste of money and waste of uh, growth hormone in terms of usage in this situation. So how do we evaluate a child with growth failure? We have to look at height. If the height is more than 3rd centile, nothing is to be done. If it's between 1st to 3rd centile, the child should be followed up. Those who have a height less than 1st centile should be screened for dysmorphism, which if present is indicative of a particular syndrome. If absent, look at the weight age and children who have predominantly weight age affection, we have to think of possibility of malnutrition and nutritional causes like infections, celiac and renal tubular acidosis. While if it is equivalent to height age, we have to look at thyroid, karyotype and growth hormone evaluation. Once the diagnosis of growth failure is established, it's very easy to have specific management. So Often it's considered to be quite expensive, but if you're making diagnosis like celiac disease, all you have to do is to stop wheat. 
and there will be a dramatic response due to alkali to RTA and thyroid and there would be a dramatic response. Celiac disease is one condition which shows dramatic improvement and we have seen in our 110 cases that the growth velocity increases from around 2 cm per year to around 12 to 13 cm per year. Similarly, growth hormone therapy is highly effective and it results in improvement from around 2 to 12 cm per year and a height gain of approximately 20 to 30 cm with maximum benefit happening by around 2 years of therapy. Children should be discouraged to take less than one year of therapy because in that situation, even though they might be concerned about cost, there won't be many advantages. So ideally, they should have a minimum of two-year therapy, which can be continued till the bones are fused. Similar observations have been observed at our clinic where we have found an increase for around 13.5 centimeters per year in terms of growth response. Growth hormone is now being used beyond growth hormone deficiency condition with Turner syndrome being the first indication with the expected benefit of around 9 to 16 years. Early diagnosis and even treatment of the toddler age group has found to be quite effective in terms of further increasing height in these children. Chronic kidney disease, particularly those children who are going for renal transplantation, a benefit of around 7 to 10 centimeters may be considered. Small for gestational age babies, out of which 20% will not catch up by around 4 years of age should be considered for therapy with good response. And Pradovili syndrome is one condition with growth failure and obesity who respond dramatically to growth hormone therapy with improvement as far as fat mass is concerned. Coming out of the most controversial area about treatment for idiopathic short stature, there have been a lot of confusions and now there is a consensus statement which has really emerged from different pediatric endocrine societies which basically says that there can be consideration given for short normal children who have a normal evaluation including endocrine parameters who can be treated if their height is particularly less. In this situation, this could be a trial of therapy. And if the child does not respond to therapy, let's say it does not increase the growth velocity by around twice over a six month period, then the treatment should be discontinued. Other we can carry forward the treatment for a longer duration. The shorter the child, we should consider more as far as giving growth hormone is concerned. 